Good morning, everyone, and welcome. My name is Alisa Sozinska, and I work for the City of Chicago Department of Business Affairs and Consumer Protection, BACP. Welcome to the BACP Business Education Workshop Webinar Series. We have adapted our regular business education workshops at City Hall into these webinars until further notice. On behalf of our commissioner, Rosa Carino, I want to inform you that business licenses can be processed online or applicable by visiting chicagobusinessdirect.org. And any websites or emails that I mentioned will be posted in the chat, so you'll be able to reference them there. And if you are part of the BACP Entrepreneur Certificate Program, you can get credit for joining this webinar by sending an email to BACPoutreach at cityofchicago.org. If you want to learn about the program, please visit chicago.gov backslash business education. To help guide your business and employees during Chicago's reopening process, including the recently modified Phase 4 guidelines, please visit chicago.gov backslash reopening. Also, BACP and the City of Chicago's Office of Emergency Management and Communications created Shy Biz Emergency Alerts. You can opt in to receive targeted emergency alerts for the business community. If you are interested, please visit chicago.gov backslash shy biz alerts. We encourage attendees to ask questions. Please use the chat box and send your questions to all panelists. There will be a question and answer session at the end of the presentation. And today's webinar will be Choosing the Right Legal Entity, a Small Business Entity webinar. It will be presented by Akili Parnell of the Chicago Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights. Welcome, Akili. Hey, good morning, everyone, and thanks for joining us today for today's webinar. Um, everyone hear me okay? Make sure the audio is good. Yes, the volume is perfect. Okay, great. So, yeah, so um, today we'll be talking about choosing the right legal entity. Um, and this is tailored for small business entrepreneurs, um, whether you are a serial entrepreneur and you've started a few different small businesses and looking to start another one or restructure your existing one, or this is your first time, um, there's a lot of really helpful information that I will present in today's uh, presentation. And so we'll give an overview of the different uh, business structures, um, the most common business structures that a small uh, business entrepreneur could, would consider, and we'll walk through the different considerations and things that you need to think about and address when uh, forming your business. Um, again, this is emphasizing the legal aspects. We'll touch on a few different tax considerations, um, but certainly, you know, to there's not it, it's not that one particular entity is better than another necessarily. Um, it sort of depends on your unique situation, and we we'll definitely recommend that you you know also speak with an accountant. Um, before making that decision. Uh, so, uh, no further ado, we'll get started. So, I'm an attorney with Chicago Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights. Um, we are a civil rights organization. We're attorneys, we're advocates that work to, um, to advance, um, racial equity and economic opportunity for all. And so we generally work in a few different uh, practice areas that is voting rights, um, education rights, um, equitable community development and housing and settlement assistance. I work in our equitable community development and housing practice group. Um, in particular, I manage our small business program. We work with uh, entrepreneurs to build, strengthen, and support small businesses and nonprofits that contribute to economic development and provide critical services uh, traditionally in lower income neighborhoods. Uh, most of our work is focused on the south and west side, um, but we work throughout the city. Um, prior to joining Chicago Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights, I was a business attorney at um, a few different private law firms and then also in house counsel for uh, what was a startup that grew into a large multi-state corporation.
So again, as I mentioned, the goals for today are to you know, emphasize the importance of your legal structure. This is one of the most important decisions that you can make as an entrepreneur. And then we'll discuss uh, in detail the four basic forms of uh, business structures. That is the sole proprietorship, the partnership, the limited liability company, and the corporation. And at the end, I think we'll touch briefly on the cooperative uh, business structure, which can fall into you know, two or more of these different business structures. So what are your, your overarching considerations? What are the main things you want to think about and when choosing um, a business entity? Um, you know, the number one thing is control. How much control do you wish to have over your entity? Um, we'll go into detail about what that looked like, but you know, if you choose one versus the other, you can have more control over it. Um, you know, if you're gonna bring in partners and you need to share control and manage that more effectively, then different, uh, maybe perhaps another business entity makes sense. Um, liability is a big one. Um, you know, how do you want to protect your personal assets? What sort of liability exposure would you face um, in your line of business? And so, you know, some lines of business are going to expose you to less, you know, legal liability, financial liability um, than others. And so that's an important consideration. Um, taxes, how do you want to be taxed? Um, you know, where do you want the earnings from the business to flow? Are they all going to come back to you personally? Are you really the only person running the business for the foreseeable future? Um, that's another important question that you'll need to answer, um, you know, to make an informed decision on which business entity you want. Uh, complexity, uh, certain legal structures are more complex and uh, more involved to maintain than others, um, more involved to set up. And so, want we'll to think about, you know, how much do you, do you want to deal with? Is this going to be a full-time, um, you know, business for you or just a side project, um, something that you want, you know, it's pretty easy to manage and really flexible. Um, that'll inform uh, your decision on which business entity you choose. And then ease and cost, um, you know, certain business entities like a corporation are generally more expensive to maintain uh, than something like a sole proprietorship or, even an LLC. And so that's another important consideration. You know, uh, most most entrepreneurs are on a shoestring budget. So, you know, if yours is a little tighter than you'd like, um, you know, then you may not want to go with the most expensive business structure, at least to start out. And of course, you can always change and modify your business structures as your business evolves. So just a quick overview of entity formation, meaning what is it, What's the process to form this business entity or structure? I'm calling them entities. That's you know, that's the kind of business, whether LLC, corporation, you know, um, sole proprietorship. We'll start there. Not technically, it's not really an entity. It's not um, you know, it's really just a structure to your business. All these are structures. But the sole proprietorship, um, there's there's no filings or anything required. It's pretty much you as an individual, you know. Say your name is Jack Daniels and you want to sell this new whiskey that you came up with um, and you know, and you just make it at home and you go and you get your business license, but everything's in your name. All the contracts are in your name, the business license is in your name, all that. And then you go and you, you know, file for a, um, a DBA, a, a, you know, basically a, an assumed identity, a business name uh, for um, generally what most the average person would call it. Um, and then you start doing business right away or eliminate stand and you get the license you required and then you say it's Jack's eliminate stand. Um, no paperwork filed um, to form the actual business structure or anything like that. It's just the individual going into business for themselves, um, you know, as themselves technically, but, you know, usually under a business name, which you just file with the county. Um, the partner, there's also a partnership. Um, Partnership is um, pretty much an agreement between one or more uh, persons to go into business and to share profits. And the structure of that can look like a lot of different things with different kinds of partnerships. Um, you know, the two that we'll touch on today are the general partnership and the limited partnership. There's also the limited liability partnership. General partnership is, you know, you and your best friend agree that y'all are going to sell. Um, baseball cards on the internet because you got a great collection and you're going to split the profits 50-50. You're both contributing 
um, certain amount of business cards to that business, you know, that can be a general partnership. You don't even necessarily have to have an agreement, um, but you can and you should, um, but there's no, no filings required by the state. Limited partnership um, is similar to a general partnership, but it's generally where you have uh, general partners who run the business and then you have limited partners who are really just investors. Um, and so there's some paperwork in most states required for that, but uh, not a ton. Um, the limited liability uh, company, um, LLC, which you know most people have heard of, um, is a newer, one of the newer forms of business entities, but it's been around for about probably 20 or so years at this point. Um, and so it's similar to a partnership that gives you limited liability protection, probably one of the most flexible um, business entities that also gives you liability protection. And uh, we'll talk about what that means in a bit. And then there's also corporations and there's different, really there's, you know, one kind of corporation, but there's um, generally for-profit corporations and non-profit corporations. And then there's like some different ways that you can manage your corporation and be taxed. And so you have your C-Corp, your S-Corp, uh, which is really just a tax election. There's nothing, you know, necessarily that, that different. Um, and then, as I mentioned before, there's cooperatives. So, Things to think about and when, de and when deciding about which one of these you want to choose is, you know, have you already formed an entity? If you're already an LLC, you know, maybe you come to this presentation today and you're thinking, uh, well, I want to become a corporation. You know, you want to think through why and what does that look like? And, you know, is it worth the time and the, and the effort and the money? Um, do you have an agreement in place? If you're already in business, you probably have a lot of different contracts in place. Maybe you already have a partnership agreement with somebody, whether formal any written or informal. Um, so that's another thing you want to think about. How do you transition all those to a new entity? Um, and so to get all that done, usually recommend you hire an attorney. Make sure you get it done right. Um, are you current with your state filings for your existing entity? You know, are you happy with it? What are the issues that um, you know are are, being, are arising due to you know your operation? Under your current entity, um, do you want to start a new business? Then maybe it makes sense, or in the business line, maybe it makes sense to start an entity for that one. Um, then another important consideration is how do you want to raise capital? Um, you know, different business structures make it more difficult or easier to raise capital. Uh, oftentimes, investors tend to like corporations, but if it's you know just a few investors, LLC works just fine in most cases. So, um, as can a partnership. And something else to think about and then as we mentioned before how's ownership and how are profits going to be handled um, how concerned are you about liability and then uh, what's your succession plan what's your exit plan um, do, you, do you want this to be a business that you own and operate for the rest of your life or is it something that you just sort of want to build up and then potentially sell or sell some of the assets up and so um the structure of business entities is in large part set by state law, and every state has its own laws around um, corporations, nonprofits, limited liability companies, partnerships, and so on. And so this is just a snapshot of some of the different laws that would apply and sort of lay out the process for forming, um, you know, whichever business entity you choose and the rules that will govern its operation. And so. Yeah, back to the sole proprietorship, as we mentioned before, uh, sole proprietorship is owned and operated by one person for profit. Um, and so here, you know, it's only going to be one particular person, but you can sort of, so you can go from a sole proprietorship to a uh, sort of partnership deal by just making an agreement with another person to uh, split the profits. Um, so some of the advantages of the sole proprietorship, this is the simple, simplest and least expensive business structure. Um, you would have complete control over all the business decisions. Um, you receive all the profits generated from that business. Um, and then, you know, sort of uh, winding down the business, closing the business is really easy because at the end of the day, you know, um, you're the boss. Um, and so with the sole proprietorship, you report um, all profits and losses on your own personal income taxes. Um, and so you wouldn't necessarily file separate taxes for the business. 
um, some of the disadvantages of the sole proprietorship are that um, the law does not distinguish between the business and its owner. So that's the biggest one that goes back into the liability issue that we talked about before. So if you're in a, um, in a line of business where you're likely to be sued or uh, likely to incur certain you know, financial liabilities or other liabilities, um, you, can, you will be personally responsible for all of those. And so there's no separation between the business and the individual um, that owns and runs the business. And then again, um, you'll need to register with the county and the state and get all your required um, business licenses with just separate process from forming actually. And so, as I said before, there's no formal process, no documentation, except for registering your business name or what we call an assumed name or DBA. You probably heard that before. Um, and then getting in an employee identification number from the IRS. And partnerships, um, we, as we mentioned before, there's two kinds of partnerships. Generally, there's a general partnership, um, there's a limited partnership. General partnership can be formed pretty informally, the handshake agreement. Um, you, can, you can split profits 50-50 or 70-30 or whatever makes sense to you. Um, again, any profits that are earned under the general partnership become, you know, personal income to the partners. And so um, there's no sort of double taxation, taxation at the business and then taxation for, for the payments that people that help run it receive, anything like that. It's just straight income to you. Uh, the limited partnership, as I mentioned before, is the same as the general partnership, um, but you have one or more limited partners who are really just investors and they have some limited liability and they're not involved in the management of the business. Um, the general manager, the general partners are the ones that are responsible for managing the business day to day. Um, and so that's one of the big distinctions between the limited partnership and the general partnership. With the limited partnership, you do need to have an agreement in place. Um, you should have an agreement in place for all of these just to spell out how things will be managed and how the money will flow. Um, but um, and this one, it, it's, it's required. Um, and then for limited partners, it's a, a big one. Their liability is limited to their investment in the partnership. So, um, you know, if that partnership runs into trouble um, and you know, has to pay for or incur certain financial liabilities or legal liabilities, um, you know, the limited partner can lose them out of their investment, but nothing beyond that. And then again, um, the limited um, the limited liability partnership in that situation, um, you know, even general partners, and this is generally for, which I didn't cover it here, it's generally for professional service providers like law firms or architects and things like that. Um, you know, their liability, one general partner's liability is protected from others. So, you know, if I'm at a law firm in general, you know, and I'm practicing and I run into trouble, you know, um, this other attorney isn't necessarily on the hook for it, but you can get a little, a little stick here um, in certain situations. So some of the advantages of the partnership um, are that it's simple and it's uh, inexpensive and it's easy to set up and structure. And um, it's probably, you know, one of the more common business structures that we see out there. Um, raising capital is, you know, pretty easy. Um, you know, you and a partner can just agree that we're going to throw in this amount of money to that and then you move along. You don't have to file a lot of, you know, documents and stuff with the state necessarily um, in order to do that. You necessarily have to worry about, you know, all these different securities regulations, or in some cases they still apply. Um, and so it, it can be helpful there. And then, you know, partners have complementary business skills. It's just a quick and seamless way to get your business up and running. Um, some of the disadvantages, as we mentioned before, uh, each partner is individually liable for their actions unless it's a, uh, unless it's a limited liability uh, partnership. Let's see, um, there's less control um, over, over the decisions that are made because you're bringing on another partner. And so that can often be a downside the profits have to be shared, um, and then the business may have to be dissolved uh, once one of the partners withdraws or passes away.
So we touched on this before, general partnership, no formal process is required to form it. Um, you know, sort of same deal as the other one, you get your tax ID number, you obtain all the necessary, you know, federal, state, and local permits, uh, you know, your register, whatever your DBA is, if you have one, um, you, know, you got to register that. Um, and then it's a limited partnership, you got to get your, your partnership agreement, but you should have one in all cases. Um, limited partnerships, there's a few more um, requirements in addition to filing a certificate of limited partnership with the Secretary of State. And so that's how you would form that. Um, you know, you can't just do that between you and your friend um, or your business partner. You got to have a written partnership agreement again here. Um, the name must contain the word limited partnership, and then you have to maintain certain records. And so that's another thing to think about. If when you go with one entity versus another with a sole proprietorship, the amount of records you need to maintain uh, year to year are going to be uh, far fewer than you would be required to maintain for a corporation or a limited partnership. And so next, the limited liability company, this is the one that's used most often by new entrepreneurs, um, tends to be just sort of the best of both worlds in terms of li liability protection and flexibility, and then also um, affordability. I mean, there's some cost in, involved in forming a limited liability company just from a legal perspective, aside from the cost you need to start your business. but. Um, you know, it's relatively manageable and uh, doesn't necessarily take a lot of ton of and, you know, additional effort to manage it year to year. Um, so the limited liability company can be, you know, one or more members. So its owners are called members, um, you know, in a corporation, the owners are called you know, uh, shareholders or stockholders, but limited liability company, the owners are called members. Um, you know, the operating agreement, uh, you don't necessarily have to have an operating agreement, but it's pretty standard to have an operating agreement, which is essentially like a partnership agreement where you agree on the ways that the LLC will be governed and uh, you agree on when the LLC will, you know, sort of distribute some of the profits that it's made at the end of the year um, and other details. Um, it can be as simple as, you know, a few pages. Um, you know, if it's only one member, it could be, uh, or two members, it could be a one to two page operating agreement, but they can go as long as, you know, 100 pages. You can almost, it, it just really gives you a lot of flexibility to do a lot of different things. And so, um, you know, there's certain set statutory requirements or legal requirements set by law, but then um, beyond that, you know, um, you can really do a lot of different things with it. Um, and then with regard to tax, we'll tell a little bit more, you know, you have flexibility with the LLC to be taxed sort of just like a partnership where uh, any profits that you earn in the business are personal income to the owners, um, or you can elect to be taxed like a corporation, um, you know, where, you know, any profits that are earned by the LLC are taxed once at a corporate level or at the company level. And then anything that's paid to the operators or the owners of the business is then taxed again um, as income. No. And then there's also sort of hybrid LLC called the L3C, which is a low profit LLC, which is basically like a limited liability company um, mixed with a nonprofit in that it also has a social mission. And the main goal of the LLC, of the L3C, is not to just maximize as much money, but to do some other good or provide some other good to uh, community or society. Um, but of course, you still make money. So some of the LOC, some of the things to consider when thinking about whether or not you should form an LOC, um, some of the advantages are that it gives you liability protection. And this can be really attractive to, um, you know, a lot of entrepreneurs because then you are not going to be personally liable for any of the um, legal liability or expenses that the business incurs in general, um, unless there's instances of like fraud or misconduct or things like that. Um, you won't personally be liable. And so, say you start, you know, your cleaning business and 
Uh, you take on a million dollar loan to get it up and running and expand or whatever the case may be. And, you know, say COVID-19 happens and now the business um, isn't really taking, isn't bringing in any revenues, not making any money, um, but you still need to pay that loan um, every month. And you get to the point where, you know, you're down to almost zero in the bank account for the business and you know you know the creditors are coming after you and stuff like that you know if you're a sole proprietor they could come after you and your home and all your other personal assets but if you have an llc in general um then the most that the creditors could do was you know um take action against the actual business and whatever assets it has and if it doesn't have that much then you know um kind of is what it is and maybe going to bankruptcy or something like that uh, but not necessarily not personal. Um, and so that's one of the big huge advantages of having an LLC. Again, legal liability as well. Um, you're in this cleaning business, you know, one of your employees does something crazy and hurts someone, um, they want to sue the business. So well, they're suing the business and not necessarily you individually, although that could be the case in certain issues. But again, you have that um, you have some protection there. Um, that's pretty important. And then you can again report your profit or losses on your personal income, or you can report it as a company, as a as a corporation. Um, you know, here you need to talk to an accountant to determine which one is um, best for you. Um, can't necessarily tell you that from a legal perspective because it just depends on a lot of different uh, factors. And then again, with the LOC, there's typically less paperwork than a corporation, so it's easier to maintain uh, year to year. Some of the disadvantages. Um, the business may have to dissolve upon the death of an owner or member. If there's no, you know, owners or members left who are running it. Again, these are things that you can address um, in your LLC agreement or your operating agreement. Um, but you know that is one disadvantage. Um, there's more paperwork than a sole proprietorship or general partnership, and it can be in certain cases more challenging to raise capital uh, through equity than with a corporation. Um, but again, that's less of a consideration for the sort of small entrepreneur in the beginning stages of business and tends to be, you know, something that, you know, companies that really plan to scale up really fast and take on institutional investors or venture capital and things like that uh, care about more than the average person. For the average person, um, the LLC works just fine um, in terms of raising capital. Then. So the way that you would form an LLC is to file articles of organization with the Secretary of State. It's uh, basically like a two-page document or so that you know you fill out and you put your you know, basic contact information in there and some a few details about you know how the business is going to be managed. Is it be you know LLC can be managed by the members, meaning the owners, meaning you know if there's a big decision that they need to make, something like that, then the owners all just hold on it and. Uh, and the owners, you know, manage the day-to-day -day operations, or they appoint someone to manage the day-to-day -day operations, versus uh, manager managed. So you got oh, you can you got member managed, which is owner managed, and then you have manager managed, which is similar to like a board of directors, um, but not quite. It's kind of, but it, it can be. It can be a lot like a board of directors, but with manager managed LOCs, uh, the members all vote on, you know, one or more managers to manage the day-to-day -day operations, at least from like a sort of um, high-level corporate uh, perspective. And so they'll make certain decisions about the contracts um, and the liabilities and things that the LLC can incur. And um, so you will vote on those and maybe you said two or three or so, but that's, again, that's something else that you could lay out um, in your articles of organization, who are the initial managers gonna be. And then you would also lay all that out in the operating agreement. And in the operating agreement, you would say, you know, we are going to be a manager managed company. Um, we can remove managers, you know, upon, you know, 51% vote or whatever of the members. Um, and all that, again, you can get as creative um, in particular as you want within the, within the law of the state. Um, and then again, you know, after you form your LLC, you'll need to acquire any necessary licenses or permits to actually do business, which is separate. And that's an important thing to realize that forming your business structure 
um, or entity is separate from getting the licenses and permits required to do whatever particular business that you want to do. And then, of course, you need to file um, each year the necessary reports with the Secretary of State. So this is one of those things we're talking about where certain businesses, um, you know, require a little bit more to maintain uh, than others. And so the LLC is one of those where you have to file uh, certain reports with the Secretary of State every year. Uh, you know, they're, it can be you're usually pretty short and it's not a ton of work, but, um, you know, filing an annual report is just something that you generally have to do with the LLC. And, Corporations. So, um, there's some costs associated with that too. So that's something to be mindful of. It's not you just form an LLC and then you, you just let it sit and don't worry about it. All right. And then the next business structure that we'll talk about is the corporation. Um, and so there's your sort of basic corporation. Um, and, you know, I got corporation and benefit corporation up here, but um, it's really kind of the same thing. I'll explain what the benefit corporation is. And, in a second, but um, all corporations have what we call you know, owners or shareholders, stockholders, same thing. And then all corporations have the board of directors. And so these are things, so the, 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 the structural requirements of a corporation are a little bit more rigid and defined by law as opposed to the LLC. You can already start to see that where with the LLC, you know, I said you could have something like a board of directors, you don't have to. But with a corporation, you do have to have some directors, or at least one director. Um, and so shareholders or owners, board of directors, or um, you know, basically a slate of elected individuals who are responsible for um, overseeing or managing some of the, the operations of the business. Um, you know, not necessarily day to day, they're not, um, directors aren't on the ground doing the work, but they are um, managing the business from a sort of a higher level, long-term strategic perspective. And then officers, so you be required to have um, a certain set of officers, like a president, treasurer, secretary. Um, so, you know, these can be all the same people. I mean, theoretically, you know, with a, you know, single shareholder corporation, you know, one person, you could be the only shareholder, the only director, and you could be the president, the secretary, and the treasurer. Um, but you have to have all those titles filled um, with the corporation. Again, the corporation offers you limited liability, so you know, can protect your personal assets um, and yourself from personal liability for um, business activities in general. Then another um, statutory or legal requirement for corporations is to have bylaws. And so you've probably heard of bylaws before, may not exactly know what they are. The bylaws are essentially um, like the operating agreement or the LLC agreement that we talked about before. It's a formal document that corporation adopts that lays out how it will be governed. And so how are directors to be elected? How, you know, how many shareholders have to vote to make certain decisions? Again, these can be like the operating agreement, like two pages and a single shareholder corporation or you know 100 pages and a bigger one um, address a lot of different things there it's a lot of flexibility as long as you stay within the few statutory requirements um, but every corporation has to adopt those bylaws and so corporations passed you know, resolutions you probably heard about and so you have to have board meetings every year um, or at least an annual meeting every year um, the stockholders and and the board of directors where you know they act on certain corporate actions or take up certain corporate actions like uh, the shareholders need to vote on directors you know whether every year or every two years or whatever set in the bylaws um, and of course the board of directors will have to meet every year um, to vote on you know certain uh, corporate matters and so those are things that you can't be flexible on um, again with the LLC uh, the managers they don't have to necessarily meet you know, ever. I mean, they have to pass, um, you know, they have to do business and they have to make decisions about certain things. And, you know, they pass something like resolutions or they vote, you know, managers vote, board of directors will vote on things, the uh, members slash owners will vote, the shareholders, stockholders will vote on things. But um, with the LLC, they don't necessarily have to meet um, every year or anything like that. Um, but that's, that's not the case with the corporation. 
And then generally with a corporation, um, they are subject to double taxation. Uh, so meaning you're taxed at the corporate level, you make, you know, a million dollars, you know, a corporation made a million dollars, they're taxed uh, on that. And then whatever is paid to uh, employees and shareholders is also taxed. And so you know, corporations can, uh, you know, pay dividends, which you probably heard about, but those, you know, whoever receives those dividends will be taxed and those dividends or whatever is being distributed was already taxed when it first came into the corporations for the double taxation. Um, the, the one exception is if you elect to be taxed as what they call an S corp. Um, and so this is not a different form of corporation really. It's really just, if you meet certain requirements, then you can elect to be taxed um, essentially as like a, a pass through uh, entity or, you know, an LLC um, or a partnership. And so, um, you know, you wouldn't be subject to that double taxation. There are certain IRS requirements, like uh, there's a cap generally on the number of shareholders that you can have. It's usually about a hundred um, and some other things that you would have to, to meet in order to um, be an S corp or elect to be taxed as an S corporation. And then once you elect, um, any as an S corp, you have to stay that way for the rest of the fiscal year. You can change the next year, but um, that election remains the same for that entire year. And there's also a benefit corporation, which you may have heard of. Um, it's really just a corporation that also um, sort of incorporates their commitment to, you know, serving some sort of public good or benefit. Um, you know, there's certain sort of requirements that they have to meet, but at the end of the day, it's really just a corporation plus some um, social mission that the corporation has. Um, there is, you know, B Corp certification that you can get um, from, you know, non-governmental um, agencies and groups that, um, you know, can give you that, that certification, but it's mostly about uh, marketing more so than actually how the business uh, functions. So some of the advantages of the corporation, um, Shareholders enjoy limited liability. You know, they can invest in a company, you know, buy some stock if it's publicly traded, you know, on your e-trade account and then kick back and, you know, you don't really have to do anything. Um, you know, you'll get stuff in the mail about the company and all that, but, um, you know, you don't really have to worry about getting sued or, or anything like that. Um, raising additional capital is through equity is pretty easy. Um, it's easy to sell stock in a corporation. Um, and again, this is another important distinction between the LLC. Um, the LLC has to be um, all of the equity, meaning, you know, ownership in an LLC has to be issued at a certain point in time. And so say, you know, you know, basically it's like, you know, you got 100% of it, all of that to be issued. So somebody has to have, you know, maybe 25%, another 25%, another 25, another 25. You can't really keep any like LLC equity interest in reserve or anything like that. Where with the corporation, you can, and there's just a lot of flexibility in how you can sort of structure the ownership of the company and restructure it um, from time to time. And so it becomes really helpful when trying to raise capital, especially from certain institutional investors that are just used to the own corporations and all the different kinds that you can get really technical and stuff and do a lot of cool stuff. But, um, you know, so that's um, something else to consider and to look into if you see yourself as, um, you know, a business that's going to scale really rapidly and take on a lot of investors and want to use some creative, uh, you know, want to get offer some creative investment opportunities to investors. Um, so, and some of the disadvantages um, organizing a corporation is that it's, just, it's really, not necessarily really expensive, but it can be the most expensive and time consuming um, for sure. And certainly more paperwork that's needed and more regulations that apply to corporations and all that. Um, and then at the end of the day, um, it, it's likely that your overall tax burden will be higher with corporation than it would be with an LLC that's you know, tax as a partnership or with a partnership or something like that. But again, it depends on your individual, um, 
you know, your, your individual tax rate based on your own income and some other factors and stuff that would determine that. As we said before, any dividends to shareholders would be taxed um, twice. So to form a corporation, you would file articles of incorporation with the Secretary of State. And so Secretary of State has a website online. Most people, the average person probably knows it as CyberDrive Illinois. Um, it's also the Secretary of State's website and uh, there's electronic forms on there and PDF forms that you can print out and file. And so you can file these articles of corporation online, completely online and pay a little fee um, or you can print it out, you can mail it in. Um, you know, that's sort of the whole school method. Um, but the articles of incorporation are similar to um, the articles of organization for the LLC. It's basically just a document that you gotta fill out and like, you know, this is the person that's incorporating or creating this um, corporation. You know, here's some other details. You gotta have a registered agent, which a registered agent, and talked about this before, is a person that is, um, that you designate to receive correspondence um, about the corporation, generally legal correspondence or correspondence from the state um, about, you know, hey, you didn't file your annual report this year, you need to do that. Um, or if you're getting sued, um, that's well, that's probably the biggest purpose of it um, is you have like an address on file, it's publicly available. So if somebody needs to see you, they know where to send the documents to. And so that person, that registered agent is responsible for receiving that and then notifying you. And so that's another cost that a lot of folks, um, you know, forget about forget. It's not a ton, but you know, to have a registered agent um, that is a company. There's companies out there that just do that, um, you know, for a living. It's their business. They usually charge between fifty to hundred, sometimes more, um, to provide different services that a registered agent can provide. Um, so definitely got to figure that out. Uh, you know, it can be an individual person, but could be your friend, but you know, they have to put their address, business address or home address or whatever the case may be online, um, which means they could just receive a bunch of unwanted emails. So that's one of the reasons why you might not wanna, you know, put like yourself or your home address or something like that um, on there as a registered agent to save money. Um, and so after you file your articles of incorporation with the Secretary of State, they get stamped, approved. Um, technically, you now have a corporation. Um, there's some other sort of actions you would need to take in order to formalize it, you know, sort of corporate formalities like initial resolutions to appoint directors and officers and all that stuff if it wasn't set out in the articles of incorporation. And then you'll need to adopt bylaws. The bylaws, you don't send these to the state, um, but you, you do need to have them. And um, so you'll need to draft some and then pass a resolution to adopt those bylaws. Um, you can amend those over time. So it's not that, you know, you, 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 know, you adopt these bylaws and then those are the bylaws forever, you know, but you gotta have something to start with. You can change them later. And then some other formalities like getting corporate minute book and corporate seal, stock certificates and all that stuff um, are the things that you'll need to do. Then the last business entity we'll talk about is the cooperative. And so this is the newest um, business entity. Um, it's not as widely used, um, but it's being used more and more, um, especially by you know, entrepreneurs um, you know, who want to sort of create this model for like more community shared wealth building. And so with the other models, um, like the corporation or the LLC, traditionally the person that puts up the most money to start the business gets the biggest share of ownership in the business, which ultimately means that they can run the business. Um, because even if they're not the director or the CEO, you know, if you own 51% of the company, depending on the bylaws or the rules around how the company is managed, you could vote, you know, when the time comes to replace that director to do that or, you know, replace that. CEO or whatever the case may be. And so, um, and then also usually when profits are distributed, um, you know, they're gonna go, you know, what they call like based on the proportion of ownership that you have. And so if you own 100%, even if you work for, you know, say you work for, you know, Microsoft and, you know, 
you're the CEO, but you don't have any ownership and you did all the work and made this company big and great. Um, but at the end of the year, you know, they're going to distribute a certain percentage of the profits or they're going to sell the company, you know, the person who owns it, maybe they didn't even do anything. They get most of the money. And so the idea behind the cooperative is that this would be a new business structure where the people doing the work, you know, say you have a factory and the people that are working in the factory, um, day to day doing all the work, one, have ownership in the business and then two, are able to vote on how the business or have some influence how the business is run. And so that's what sort of the key distinctives of the cooperative is that it's democratically owned and operated um, compared to where that's not necessarily the case with other businesses. And so Illinois has a few different options for folks that want to start co-ops. You can start a co-op with, um, you know, an LLC business structure or um, a corporation or this newer business entity called the Limited Worker Cooperative Association, the Limited Cooperative Association. And so this was created, uh, I guess maybe like, I think the bill passed on the end of 2018 and maybe one effective in 2019. So it's been around for like a year, it's not a ton, um, but it, you know, it's a new business model that a lot of folks find really interesting. And basically, you know, you need like three or more members, um, and there's some exceptions unless the by member, I mean owner, um, unless the sole owner is a cooperative, um, you'll have like the group of workers slash owners and they constitute like the group of people that vote. So they call that an assembly. Um, and then generally you have to have three leaders. Um, and then again, there's a bunch of exceptions. I don't wanna go too far in the details on all these cause it might get confusing, but um, you know, otherwise it can function very similar to your corporation or your LLC. You're offered limited liability, you got to have bylaws. Um, and then one benefit is that you can sort of shift the ownership or the equity around easier with a cooperative because you'll be exempt from um, securities regulations, which securities regulations um, generally require you to register transfer of ownership in a business. So if you sell a little bit of stock in your corporation, you know, you got to make sure that one, that sale meets with the state's laws and the federal laws. Um, so there's a bunch of rules around when you can sell stock and not sell stock or sell equity and LLC and not sell it. And so with the cooperative, you're generally exempt from uh, state rules. So that's, you know, those cost savings and then just procedurally just easier. Um, and so that's another way to incentivize uh, creation of the use of co-ops. Um, and so then there's also the cooperative corporation that existed um, in Illinois before this most recent bill was passed. And um, that's essentially just a standard corporation that structures itself in a way that it meets all the criteria of what a co-op should be. And so still certain rules if you use that model, but you could still be considered a co-op. Um, this lays some of those out right there. Um, if you want more information about that, then we can send some around. Um, some of the advantages, uh, you know, there's the opportunity for like more shared wealth and decision making. Um, and so, you know, if you have a co-op and you got a hundred workers, you know, theoretically you would have a hundred different owners and, you know, one person's vote matters just as much as the other person's as opposed to a corporation and, you know, the person that owns 100% of the company, I mean, they have 51% of the votes. And so, regardless of anything else. And so there's some sort of uh, equality there in the cooperative structure that is baked in. And then everybody, for the most part, that works there has to be an owner. And so, uh, you know, you have an ownership stake. And so that's an additional incentive to work harder to make the business grow. And then, you know, that if the company makes a bunch of money this year, you'll get some of that um, left over. So um, then again, as I mentioned, the democratic control over the of the company, um, it really focuses on the workers because they can influence the day-to-day -day operations and conditions they, they're facing. Um, and then marketing, like people think, you know, a lot of people think it's really cool to have a co-op, especially pretty popular with um, some grocery stores and in agriculture and things like that. Um, and there's different kinds of co-ops where it's not necessarily a worker co-op. Sometimes it's a it's a co-op that's owned by the people that use or, you know, buy its goods. So maybe a community owns, you know, portions of a 
a grocery store co-op or something like that. So there's, there's different ways, but um, some of the disadvantages of the co-op um, is that it's just new, people don't really understand it. And could be a little expensive and time consuming to figure it out. But, you know, that's just until, you know, more people do it and then um, it probably gets easier once you just have that sort of that playbook on how to how to run things, how to get it started. Um, a little bit less flexibility raising capital through equity. Um, again, you do get that state law securities exemption to raise money, so that's, that's a good thing. But, um, you know, investors may be a little bit more like, okay, what's going on here? Like, where do I fit into this? I don't want to work there. How do I, you know, how do I invest in this business? Um, there's ways to do that, but it's just, it's not necessarily the same as a corporation. Um, and then there's additional, you know, regulatory and organizational challenges, you know, just figuring out, you know, it, you know, with the bylaws for a co-op, you can't necessarily just take bylaws from a regular corporation and then just adopt those because organizationally and structurally, it wouldn't meet the requirements of what a co-op is supposed to be. So you have to get creative and, you know, get an attorney to, to do that. There's great attorneys out there that can do that. So it's just something to be aware of. And then some special tax considerations. IRS treats co-ops a little differently, not in a bad way necessarily, but you just need to know what those mean. So when you're talking to them. Uh, the forum one, it's pretty similar to the others. You know, you file uh, articles of organization with the Secretary of State. Um, if you're a corporation co-op, then you know, you just form a corporation, and then you elect to be a co-op by complying with uh, state laws that will you know, or set for how you become a co-op, um, how you qualify as a co-op. You pay the filing fee, same as the others. You adopt bylaws, same as the other, or operating agreement, um, and all the other corporate formalities. You appoint, you know, this is the president of the co-op, secretary, you know, other positions, directors, and so on. Um, but yeah, if, if, you, if you don't take away anything else from today's presentation, you know, just main point that I want to get across is that one business entity is not necessarily better than the other. Um, and then your initial choice of business structure doesn't, it isn't permanent. You can change it. Um, you know, what you're trying to change to may make things a little more complicated, changing from a for-profit to a for or to a non-profit or something like that. And vice versa, it can get a little complicated, but you can even do that. It's been, it happens. Um, and so uh, just understand that there is flexibility and all that, but it's best to get it right from the beginning because if you don't, it costs time and it costs money. Um, and then next, I just want to go over some quick legal resources. Um, so I talked a lot about, hey, get an attorney, get an attorney, and I'm sure you all are like, hey, I'd love to, but they're not free. They cost money. Uh, don't have a lot of extra money. Um, and so there are some resources to support you there. Um, of course, the city of Chicago, small business resources. Um, you know, BACP, which you're already connected with, provides a lot of, um, you know, business operational and startup help and help on licensing and figuring out zoning, all the stuff I didn't talk about today, super helpful. Um, the Illinois State Bar Station, if you go online, uh, they have a guide on how to organize, um, or how to set up a corporation or an LLC. So, you know, like I went through the presentation today, you're like, I wanna do that. I'm gonna find out more, you know, what I would recommend. Uh, even before trying to get an attorney is just to like download one of these guides. You can Google it and then just sort of read through it because you need to know what the process involves. You know, it's one thing to get an attorney that can set it up, but you're going to be responsible for maintaining it. And so, um, you know, you want to know what's involved and how to structure it and all that stuff. Um, so we at Chicago Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights, um, you know, we offer uh, pro bono legal clinics from time to time and pro bono transactional assistance um, qualifying applicants so not just not not just anybody but if you qualify we have an application online that you can find on our website um, and then you know if you were referred through a community partner and you're ready you know then um, you know that we can connect you um, oftentimes with a pro bono which means free um, you know attorney who can help you set up your LLC, help you draft your operating agreement or your bylaws or whatever the case may be, um, you know, and help you scale your business through legal support. Um, Carpels is a pro bono legal aid hotline online. It can answer different questions that you might have, you know, outside of the business context or um, maybe related to litigation. We don't, as Chicago Lawyers Committee, handle the business litigation. So if you have a, you 
want to sue someone or being sued and stuff like that, you know, um, you know, there's some other resources out there that can, you know, either help you or point you in the right direction. Um, and on the transactional side, the Justice Entrepreneur uh, Project, called the JEP Attorneys for short, uh, JEP. Um, these are private attorneys with more flexible rates because, you know, so we are, um, we do offer pro bono assistance, but you have to qualify and there's certain income and eligibility criteria. And, you know, um, you know, so if you don't qualify under us or some other folks, um, it's pro bono eligibility standards, you could um, get one of these JEP attorneys with more flexible rates. Um, and they're really great. Illinois Legal Aid Online is another resource. And then for small businesses, uh, UIC John Marshall Law School also offers pro bono legal assistance uh, for small businesses and um, nonprofits and, and similar enterprises. Um, and so definitely reach out to them as well. They have their own criteria about who they accept and why and all that, but uh, they have an application online that you can submit to. All right. So now go to questions. Great, thank you so much, Akili. It seems like you covered everything really in depth. Um, so thank you for that. We do have some questions that came in. First question is, how should you consider the pros slash cons of estate planning, retirement planning, and health care between the structures? And then there's a couple more follow-up questions from this person, but I'll have you answer the first one. Okay, um, estate planning. I don't, you know, unfortunately, I don't know a ton about that and how that, you know, that's not something I've encountered a lot, but it's certainly a good, it, I certainly understand the, the question, um, especially for, a, you know, um, sort of slow entrepreneur, like mom and pop business or something like that. Um, I mean, I would say that, you know, this isn't directly addressing estate planning, but, it, you know, it's relevant as, sort of just think about, you know, if it's a family owned business, you know, who should, you know, maybe be a manager, or director, or an owner or something like that in case, you know, something happens and, um, you know, you want to easily pass on ownership of the business, you know, it's easier to already have someone, you know, sort of folded into the ownership structure, the management structure of the business uh, before that happens versus trying to deal with it as a estate planning issue alone after the fact. So that that's just my thoughts, but then again, you know, um, I would say talk to an estate uh, planning attorney, trust the state's attorney or something like that, and uh, we need some more details. Okay. And this person also asked, how difficult is it to change slash modify your structure? Yeah, so that just depends on what you're trying to move from and what you're moving to um, but you know say uh, and then it also depends on where you are in your business so if you already have you know a business with a lot of clients you got a lot of contracts in place and all that stuff and you know that makes things a little bit more complicated but you know it was just look at it and we'll simply say you formed last year you formed an llc haven't really done anything with it um you know so you haven't done anything with the business but you formed the llc now you're like okay I need to be a corporation for whatever reason. Um, you know, there's, a, there's documents online where, uh, on, you know, at the Secretary of State's website, I think it's called, uh, I can't remember the exact name, but it's, uh, you'll see it, it'd be like an LLC or a corporation conversion document or filing or whatever. And so you would, um, you would get that and there's some other requirements. You fill that out and that would get you started. And just sort of depending on the makeup of the ownership, if you're the only owner, but the business is real it's pretty simple and straightforward because then you're the only one that needs to sign off but it's, it's a bunch of other people and all that you gotta get them to agree to convert to a corporation or convert from a corporation to an llc and all that stuff um, and sometimes that means that you gotta incur additional legal fees to cover all that and so you know it's not necessarily too complicated but it can it can be just depending on where you are. So, like I said before, if you have a bunch of contracts signed with someone else with in different companies and all that stuff, and you also, you know, probably need to, you know, reflect that in those agreements. Um, so that's something else to think about. Thank you. And 
Final question by this person was, may you start a parent company in one state and set up a sister in another? Let's see, could you repeat, let me make sure I understand that because you're saying, um, can you start in one one state and then sort of uh, change, you convert to, uh, you're, you're re-domesticate into another company? I mean, into another state? And there actually is a follow-up uh, question to Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, so, yeah, I mean, say if you're, uh, you know, domicile or whatever in um, California, and then you like, hey, we want to be an Illinois company. Um, yeah, so you can do that. I mean, there's rules. You got to figure out what the California rules are about doing that. Um, but, you know, and then make sure that, you know, you comply with Illinois rules too. But yeah, you can sort of read them so you can change, you know, you know, the state of incorporation more or less. And a similar, somewhat similar question was, uh, where should I incorporate? Um, often heard of incorporating in Delaware or Nevada. Yeah, I mean, it's, again, like I can't just, it's not, um, yeah, so a lot of people do incorporate in Delaware. Most of the people that incorporate in Delaware, though, are, um, you know, sort of one to be like multinational corporations or LLCs or whatever, or are in a particular line of business where it doesn't really matter where you are. And so um, certain industries um, would require you to, you know, be set up in a particular state. So say like in Illinois, if you want to start like a hemp business or something like that, like that business needs to be formed in Illinois. It had to be an Illinois LLC or Illinois corporation. It couldn't be a Delaware corporation and then no interest in that business or something like that, for an example. Um, and so um, the reason that some people set up in Delaware or Nevada or other places is because um, this is the law around, you know, you know, law there is just more favorable. And then sometimes the tax situation is more favorable, but again, it just depends on the particular line of business more than anything. And there's no one set um, answer for what's better for a particular person. Sometimes it doesn't even matter if it would be better over there. You just have to be in Illinois business because of the business line that you're going into. Great, thank you. A question came in, what is the average cost to form a in terms of to form in terms of organizing with the state uh, co-op structure specifically. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, as far as your state filings, um, they're about the same as a corporation or an LLC. I think um, it's maybe like $150 to file, um, you know, your articles of organization. Um, and I think that's about the same for the LLC and the corporation. I think they're all about the same. It's about the same. It's pretty much the same process. Um, and then if you want like expedited service, meaning you don't want to wait two weeks to see if you're, you know, your formation docs got approved and you pay like another hundred dollars, so it'd be like $250 uh, to form it. And so that's the, that's the cost of, you know, form it at that point. I mean, you do have a co-op, um, the cost to get all the other stuff put in place, like appoint directors and you know create your bylaws and all that stuff that just depends on legal fees and, and that depends on which attorney you get and all that stuff um and so those costs can um be all over the place it can be pro bono potentially if you qualify or it could be um you know a few thousand dollars or so so um but you know it's, it's about the same as LOC co-ops pretty you know the costs are pretty pretty standard just you know, putting the actual, and once you form the entity and then actually getting the business up and running, I mean, those, those costs just depend on what you're, what all you're trying to do and, and all that, so. Thank you. Question came in. Does it matter how I incorporate um, if I plan to potentially sell or go public? Uh, yeah, yeah, it does matter. Um, you know, if you think you're gonna go public, then, you know, um, you may want to be a corporation from the beginning, but again, like, um, you know, I've worked on some IPOs and stuff in the past and, um, 
for a variety of different reasons, usually that don't have anything to do with like legal considerations, usually driven by accounting and stuff. Some companies were LOCs and then they wanted to go public and then, you know, they went, they did all these, you know, corporate gymnastics to, you know, acquire another corporation that was already public and then sort of folded their existing business into that. And then that went and then that became the parent company and then they were public or, you know, sometimes they're LOC and then they convert to a corporation and all that for usually again like accounting and financial reasons and and then they become a corporation that way so um, but if you know from the very beginning that like that's what you want to do again you got to talk to an accountant because maybe the accountant would be like no for right now just be an llc for a million reasons that um i don't necessarily understand um and so again there's not there's not necessarily one you know way to approach that but um I'd probably say, yeah, just probably do a corporation if you want to go public. But again, that's a long road usually for most companies. So, thank you. A uh, question is Does the DBA have to be the same as the LLC? Can you also then explain a little bit to our attendees who may not know about DBA? Yeah, yeah. So, the, uh, the DBA. Uh, DBA is just a business name. And so say, you know, you form a company, like if you look at a lot of companies, like, I don't know, this is for sure, but for like Starbucks or something, like, I don't know the actual like technical legal name of the parent company of Starbucks is Starbucks Inc. or something like that. Um, it might be, it could be anything. It could be, you know, LL23 Inc. or something like that. And then they file for a DBA and the DBA is Starbucks. Um, and so the DBA is just a business name. And so you, you know, you apply to have a business name, assuming it's not already taken by someone else. So, you know, theoretically, it doesn't necessarily matter what you call your LLC or your corporation and it's corporation docs. So when you file with the secretary of state, you know, it doesn't necessarily matter what you call it. Um, you know, you can, you can have both aligned, but so there's reasons that you wouldn't necessarily want your business name to match your you know corporate name and stuff like that um and so anyway the dba it just means um you know doing business has and so that's you know you know the company is ll23 inc but we're doing business as you know bob's you know chicken shack or something like that and so you file that name with this with the state um, or the county so that they know you know which business entity is actually like doing business and so that you can secure that name and so that nobody else can take it. And so, um, yeah, that, and that's a, but that's a common um, area of confusion where um, most folks do, you know, think that the LLC name, the actual LLC name needs to be the business name that you want to go by. That's not the case. Great, thanks. Can you briefly just mentioned about um, protecting your name. So question is, once I form a corporation or LLC, is my name automatically protected in all 50 states? Um, so no. So, um, so as far as the name of the LLC, the name of the LLC is definitely protected in that state. But, you know, another state could have another LLC with the exact same name. And so, you know, if you want brand protection, which is different from protecting the name of the LLC, like brand protection sort of starts to get into the DBA area and stuff like we talked about before. And that falls into like the, um, the realm of trademarks and stuff. And so like, if you want to protect, you know, like the McDonald's logo and the name McDonald's and all that kind of stuff, it's not so much about filing, you know, creating an LLC in Illinois, that's McDonald's LLC, at that point, it's more about I own the trademark to McDonald's brand and name and all that stuff. And other people can't create a burger company or a burger business, you know, name McDonald's with similar logos and colors and things like that. And so, you know, there, with, with trademark protection, which is a form of intellectual property protection, there's, you know, there's state protection um, that you can file and apply for. And then there's also like federal protection that you can apply for and stuff. So. Um, those are those are slightly different things, but they can uh, sort of interact and overlap to a certain degree. Thank you. 
and I'm not sure if you're able to answer this question or if it's more of an accountant question, but um, mm -hmm. from an income tax perspective, what are the benefits of an LLC over an S corp? Yeah, I mean, uh, I can't I can't answer that question necessarily. I'm not sure that and that probably just would have to depend on a particular situation. I don't know if there's just a simple reason why um, an LLC would be better than an S corp, like an LLC taxes partnership. I mean, ideally, it's supposed to be treated the same. So I'm not sure that there is a difference or a benefit. But you know, accounting rules are pretty particular. So um, there's a lot I don't know about it. So I'm definitely ask an accountant. Next question, and we're only going to do a couple more. Um, going to end with a few easy ones for you. Uh, so <laughs> is, how many owners can an LLC have? Yeah, I mean, you can have as, as many as you want. Uh, there's, there's no limit. I mean, you can break up that 100% ownership into as many small pieces as a, a math can allow, and you know, you can do paperwork for, and the secretary can handle. Um, so there's no cap on the number of owners you can have in in most of these, except the S corp. Generally, is limited to 100, and then the co-op there might be some limits and caps on that. But yeah, no, LLC, you're fine. Thank you. And ending with a what seems to be a very timely one of when is the best time to incorporate. Mm, yeah, I mean, that just, you know, I can't answer that question for you. It just sort of depends on your unique situation and stuff. Um, some things I think about is, you know, you know, if you have extra time and all that and have time to build up your business. I mean, at the end of the day, the, the business structure is just, you know, the business structure um, is just the legal structure and the business, building the business is really more on the entrepreneur. But um, and I'd say the best time is before you start your business. And so if you know, like you got a business plan and a business model and all that stuff. You know where you want to go, but you haven't started signing contracts or acquiring assets for the business and all that stuff. I think you should do you should form the entity before you do all that stuff. And so before you acquire assets, before you develop like a super valuable IP and all that stuff, if possible, and all that, I would form the entity just to make sure it's more seamless so that everything is owned by the corporation and to reduce your legal fees of like trying to fix stuff after the fact. And so that doesn't always happen because, you know, um, life doesn't always just work out that way and that's fine. Um, most entrepreneurs do end up in a situation where they do have to put some legal structure or you know, restructure things after they've already started to build the business or they already have intellectual property. That's a that's really common, especially in the uh, tech space where, you know, maybe an entrepreneur or a regular person, um, you know, you know, scientists create something and then he's like, you know, meet some some people who are like, hey, we can go into business and we can do something with this. And he's like, oh, okay, cool. But he actually, you know, he owns maybe the patent or whatever intellectual property to that product or that concept or whatever. And then they want to form an entity. And so they have to, you know, sort of assign the ownership of that to the company in exchange for ownership and all that stuff like that happens. But ideally, all that would have been done before you know, there was, you know, concrete business concepts and products and concept and contracts and all that stuff. Great, thank you so much. Um, and just briefly looking on this slide, I see that you mentioned um, the Small Business Center and previously, normally, yes, um, this organization is in our Small Business Center, our solution station. Um, remind me, Keely, if you guys are still doing remote counseling. Um, so we're doing limited remote counseling. We're not doing, um, right now, we're not doing Solution Station the way we were. Um, so, but hopefully, you know, this pandemic ends soon and we can go back to that. But um, through some other uh, office hours with some other community partners and stuff, we've like, still been offering them. So. Great, and I did post the website um, for the Chicago Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights in the chat. Um, so attendees, you could easily click on it and reference it to see all the different ways the organization is helping Chicago uh, business owners and beyond. 
So thank you so much for joining us, Akili. Always thank you for sharing your knowledge and helping Chicago's entrepreneurs. Thank you. Yeah. Well, thanks for having me. Oh, absolutely. Thank you everyone for joining us this morning and we hope you have a good rest of the day and weekend. Thank you.